I'm Aiden Carney of Turtle Boy Daily News. I've been investigating the death of John O'Keefe from Canton, Massachusetts. His girlfriend, Karen Reed, is charged with his murder. Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. That's the view it would have gotten. But is there something more going on here? Is Karen Reed the victim of a massive cover-up? During my investigation, I have uncovered a town full of corruption. Here's what I believe happened, and why I believe Karen Reed was framed. Don't you want to ask some questions? I know you do. I do. I, I have know been. you. Do. I have. I think that you could outsmart Karen Reed. Did you? <laughs> it's. How can you wear those buttons when you covered up his murder? Any comment on that? Why you Google that at 227? On the morning of January 29, 2022, Boston police officer John O'Keefe was found dead outside of the Canton home of Boston Police Sergeant Brian Albert on 34 Fairview Road. O'Keefe's girlfriend, Karen Reed, was charged with manslaughter after reportedly backing over O'Keefe with her car after she got into a fight with him and dropped him off at Albert's house after a night of drinking. She was castigated widely as a cop-killing villain, set to face decades in prison. But as it would turn out, at least a dozen people were in the house when John John O'Keefe was being violently beaten to death before hatching an elaborate plot to frame Karen Reed for killing him. The cover-up was aided and abetted by members of the state police, the Canton Police Department, and the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office. This is the story of one woman, alone, facing down some of the most powerful, well-protected people in the state who sought to destroy her life and exonerate herself. This is Karen Reed and John O'Keefe. Karen is an intelligent, successful accountant and college professor with not even a hint of a criminal record. She'd been dating John O'Keefe for several years and loved his niece and nephew, who he adopted after both of their parents, including his sister, passed away. She owned a house in Mansfield that was rented out, but lived with O'Keefe and his niece and nephew at his home on One Meadows Ave in Canton. O'Keefe was a well-liked veteran, 16 years on the force, of the Boston Police Department. On February 2nd, Reed was charged with killing John O'Keefe. Only with manslaughter, though. And she may have actually believed she was responsible. Four months later, in June, the charges were upgraded to murder, despite no real evidence coming out that added to the story. State Trooper Michael Proctor wrote the criminal complaint for her arrest, noting his 10 years of experience on the State Police Detective Unit at the Norfolk County DA's office. The charging documents state that Canton officers Seraf and Malini were dispatched at 6.04 a.m. on January 29th to 34 Fairview Road, where they found three females. Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Kerry Roberts, next to the body of John O'Keefe. Karen Reed was performing CPR. Jennifer McCabe is pictured in this photo on the right next to her sister, Nicole Albert, who is the wife of well-connected Boston Police Sergeant Brian Albert. Brian is on the Fugitive Apprehension Team. He is a trained MMA fighter, and he was featured on the cop show Boston's Finest. At 11.30 a.m. on January 29th, Trooper Proctor interviewed Jennifer McCabe and her husband, Matthew McCabe, along with with Brian Albert and Nicole Albert comfortably at the home of Jennifer McCabe. They told him that they were at out at the Waterfall Bar in Canton where Jennifer McCabe met up with her friend John O'Keefe and his girlfriend Karen Reed who she did not know very well. The connection between them was that John O'Keefe's niece was good friends with Jennifer McCabe's daughter. Trooper Proctor was allegedly told by Jennifer that she saw Reed enter the bar carrying a vodka soda drink in a glass, which most bars would not allow and indicated that perhaps she was drunk. The three grown adults in their 40s left shortly after midnight to go to an after party at Brian Albert's house. According to Jennifer, she got there first. At 12.30, she says that she witnessed Karen Reed drive up on her black Lexus SUV. Since O'Keefe only knew McCabe at this house, he texted her to make sure that she was there. Jennifer claimed that John O'Keefe never entered the house. So she texted him, hello, at 1245, before witnessing Karen drive away in her black SUV. We would later find out that most of that was a lie. She told Proctor that she assumed that he and Reed decided to go home. Jennifer received a phone call from a distraught Karen at 4.53 a.m. looking for O'Keefe. Jennifer, who for some reason was still up at 4.53 a.m. after a night of drinking, told Trooper Proctor that she offered to help Karen look for John O'Keefe along with O'Keefe's friend, Carrie Roberts, who was 
not at the house that night. Karen was hysterical and could not drive in her condition, so Carrie drove both of them. Jennifer claims that during the ride, Karen said, quote, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? She also told the state police that Karen's SUV had a cracked taillight. The two of them then jumped in Carrie Roberts' car and they drove back to 34 Fairview Road. When they got there, Karen immediately noticed O'Keefe's body outside, but the other two did not. This was part of the reason that Karen was charged. Trooper Proctor believed that Karen knew exactly where the body would be because she knew that she ran him over and left him to die during the middle of the snowstorm. We later recreated this scene at 34 Fairview Road. John O'Keefe was six foot two inches, 217 pounds. His body was found exactly 12 feet from the curb. There are no obstructions blocking anyone from seeing him. It would have been physically impossible for Kerry Roberts and Jennifer McCabe not to have seen his body because they were sitting in the front. They were also specifically looking for a body at that time. And somehow they claim that they did not see him, but Karen redid and this ended up implicating her. O'Keefe's arm had six bloodied lacerations and his eyes were swollen shut in black and blue. His eyelid had a cut on it and his clothes were covered in blood and vomit. A medical examiner said that he had two swollen black eyes, a cut on the left side of his nose, a two inch laceration in the back of his head and multiple skull fractures. There is no possible way that he could have these kinds of injuries from being backed into by his girlfriend's car, especially since the snow and grass would have comforted his fall. Kerry Roberts told Trooper Proctor that Karen Reed was drunk and hysterical when she saw her at 5 a.m. and stated that she was so drunk she didn't even remember going there. Kerry repeated the same story as Jennifer, that Karen made statements suggesting that she may have accidentally hit him or that he had gotten hit by a plow. At 4.30 p.m., Trooper Proctor claimed that he went to the home of Karen Reed's parents in Dighton and claimed to have observed her SUV parked in the driveway with a shattered taillight. We would later find out that this was untrue. Call logs from the Dighton Police Department show that Trooper Proctor actually called for a, a tow truck at 3.02 p.m. before he had ever allegedly even seen the broken taillight and thus would have no reason to tow the car. We also have footage from Karen Reed's parents' house showing the car being towed at 4.12 p.m. ADA Adam Lally would later blame that on daylight savings even though Alarm.com automatically resets for daylight savings. This proves that Trooper Proctor was lying about what time he took the car, leaving him alone with the vehicle unaccounted for at least one hour and 18 minutes. Proctor interviewed her and Karen denied bringing a drink into the waterfall bar. She said that she dropped O'Keefe off at the party at 12.15, but since she didn't know anyone there very well, she was feeling sick and she was a grown-ass woman in her 40s who doesn't go to after parties and play beer pong, so she elected not to stay. She lived with O'Keefe less than three miles away, so getting home wouldn't be a problem for him. Proctor claimed that Karen told him that she never saw O'Keefe go inside the house and had no idea how she had a broken taillight. Both of these statements made her look guilty. When she found O'Keefe's body later, his eyes were swollen and he was still bleeding from the nose and mouth. Karen attempted to call and text John O'Keefe multiple times after dropping him off. He would never not come home, knowing his niece and nephew needed him in the morning. Trooper Proctor asked her leading question designed to incriminate her about whether or not she had ever been in an argument with O'Keefe and there isn't a couple on earth that hasn't been in a fight before. So Karen felt it was normal to tell Proctor that they had an argument over breakfast. This is why you should never talk to police without a lawyer if you're a suspect in a crime. They are not there to be your friend. They are there to get you to say something that will lead you to being charged criminally. A Canton firefighter who we later found out was good friends with Caitlin Albert, the grown daughter of Brian Albert, who was inside 34 Fairview Road the night that John O'Keefe was killed was one of the first responders to the scene. She told Trooper Proctor that Karen said to her friend, I hit him, quote unquote, several times, further incriminating herself. Proctor's report also states that two red pieces of taillight were next to O'Keefe's body, which was the final piece of evidence needed to charge her with manslaughter. Except in the original report from the Canton Police Department, it never mentions anything about any taillight. And only two inches of snow had fallen at that time. As a matter of fact, the only thing that they found were droplets of blood which they kept in red solo cups and some shattered cocktail glass which apparently Karen Reed hit him with before backing into him with her car and killing him. Sure. But Trooper Proctor never once mentioned that he was a close personal friend with the McCabe and Albert families which were prominent names in Ken. Here's a picture from Proctor's sister's Facebook page showing Trooper Proctor with Jennifer McCabe's children. ADA Adam Lally would later contend the children, the, the child that's the 
depicted in that particular photograph is not one of the McCabe's children. Oh, really? McCabe's have four daughters. That's not one of them. It's a relative. Indeed, he does have his arm around his niece. However, there are two girls in towels and bathing suits directly behind him who are, in fact, Jennifer McCabe's children. Here is another picture from Proctor's sister's Facebook page showing her at a family party with Chris Albert, the brother of Brian Albert, directly behind her. Chris Albert was at the bar with O'Keefe the night he was killed, and he owns a local pizza shop in town called d &E Pizza. It's unknown if he was inside his brother's house that night because Trooper Proctor has deliberately prevented Google Google from sharing geofence data that could provide that information. Chris Albert lived at Seven Meadows Ave in Canton, three doors away from John O'Keefe, who lived at One Meadows Ave. Chris's son, Colin Albert, was an 18-year-old senior at Canton High School at the time of the incident and is confirmed to have been inside the house at 34 Fairview Road that night. Colin was a star football player at uh, Canton High School and a notorious hothead. There are multiple videos that we have posted of Colin in which he's threatening rivals in town and even ends it with bang, go, bang, go, bang, bang, apparently is supposed to scare you into believing that this man will kill you. Two days after John O'Keefe died, the Canton High School Twitter account announced that Colin would be playing football at Bridgewater State next year. Colin is an out-of-control meathead who frequently was confrontational towards his much older adult neighbor, John O'Keefe. He constantly trespassed on his property, threw beer cans on his lawn. He is the prototypical jock who thinks that Shakespeare was a huge loser and infamously poses for pictures sticking either his middle finger up or his fist in the air while pounding down Dylan Mulvaney lights. Colin has anger issues and gets off on knowing that he comes from a well-connected family in town. His uncle Brian, of course, is a Boston police sergeant. His uncle Kevin is a Canton police officer. His father, Chris, was recently elected to the Board of Selectmen. Here he is on the left, pictured with his father and his uncle, Brian, on the far right. The man in the middle is his other uncle, Tim Albert, the family moron who takes pride in being from a well-connected family, despite providing Providing nothing of value to contribute to the family's brand name. True Proctor's family knew Colin since he was a little boy. Here he is pictured with his uh, Michael Proctor's sister once again. Here's another picture of Proctor's sister. She posted on Facebook from her 2012 wedding showing True Proctor on the far left and Colin on the right as a seven-year-old boy. They were both in the wedding party together. Not once did it ever occur to Proctor to mention that he was a close friend to a well-connected Canton family of cops and politicians and was investigating the death of a Boston police officer at one of their homes. He was in possession of all evidence to this crime and decided who would, and more importantly, who would not be investigated. I listen there is this. no conflict. Trooper Proctor is not conflicted in this case. I, I indicated that. Colin Albert likes to get in fights and boast about it. A picture he posted on Visco shortly after the death of John O'Keefe shows his right knuckles covered in abrasions, indicating that he had punched someone or something recently. None of this has been made public and the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office hasn't sent a mountain of exculpatory evidence to Karen Reed's defense attorneys until recently. This evidence that they've withheld includes DNA evidence from John's body that could prove whether or not a dog had bitten him, for instance, uh, as well as a two-minute video clip from the Canton Library, which would have shown whether or not Karen Reed's taillight was broken after dropping John O'Keefe off at 34 Fairview Road, because if it wasn't broken, that means that she didn't hit him with her car. This evidence proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that she had nothing to do with John O'Keefe's death, but suggests that Colin Albert, Brian Albert, Brian Albert's German Shepherd, Chloe, Jennifer McCabe, Matt McCabe, and every other person in that house either witnessed or knew about the murder of John O'Keefe and conspired to frame Karen Reed after the fact. Unfortunately for them, Karen Reed is an extremely intelligent and well-resourced woman who can afford world-class representations. She initially had an attorney by the name of David Yanetti, a well-respected Boston lawyer with more than 30 years of experience who used to be a prosecutor. However, Yanetti can only do so much, and Karen Reed quickly realized after time that she was up against some powerful forces and she would need more representation, particularly when it came to cell phone expertise, which a lot of this case hinges on. So she did some searching and she found a guy by the name of Alan Jackson from Los Angeles who had previously represented a man by the name of Kevin Spacey in Nantucket. Kevin Spacey was accused of sexually assaulting an 18-year-old bartender, 
But later we found out through the use of forensic technology that the quote unquote victim and his mother had deleted a number of incriminating messages that showed that the boy was not actually a victim at all. Her attorneys filed a motion demanding a forensic audit of Jennifer McCabe and Brian Albert's cell phones and for all communications before and after O'Keefe's death. However, to this day, they have not gotten Albert's cell phone. Jennifer McCabe, on the other hand, voluntarily handed over her phone, thinking that if she deleted enough information, no one would find it. And indeed, that initially worked. State police detective Nicholas Guarino claimed to do a full extraction of her phone and nothing really incriminating came back. But it didn't smell right to Alan Jackson. So they did another search of her phone and they hired a man by the name of Richard Green, an expert in his field. And Richard Green did a much more thorough and expensive search into Jennifer McCabe's phone. What they discovered in April was shocking. They found that the Norfolk County DA's office intentionally hid evidence showing that Jennifer McCabe had searched, quote, how long to die in cold, except she spelt it H-O-S, Haas long to die in cold, at 2.27 a.m. on the night that John O'Keefe died. Well, how could she do that if she thought, why would she do that? More importantly, if she believed, as she told Trooper Proctor, that John O'Keefe had gone home and gone to bed, why would he possibly be dying in the cold? Unless, of course, the plan was to put his body in the cold so that he died from hypothermia. How can you wear those buttons when you covered up his murder? Any comment on that? Why you Google that at 227? Any comment, Mr. McCabe? Brian Albert was never questioned at his house, only at the McCabe's house, which was interesting because a dead body was found in his yard. Canton Deputy Police Chief Tom Keller happens to live across the street from Brian Albert on Fairview Road. He has a ring camera that would have picked up video of O'Keefe's body being hit that night. That's that's the view it would have gotten. That's the exact view. Wow. However, he told police that conveniently he did not capture anything of value on his ring camera. It was never subpoenaed. Jennifer McCabe not only searched for how long to die in cold, she also deleted all communications on her phone between herself, Brian Albert, and, his, and her sister, Nicole Albert. If Jennifer McCabe didn't think it was unusual for John O'Keefe to leave, then why did she stay up until 5 a.m. awaiting Karen Reed's phone call about John O'Keefe being missing? If Jennifer McCabe had nothing to hide, then why was she destroying critical evidence around the time that John O'Keefe's body was discovered. Why was Jennifer McCabe more committed to protecting Brian Albert than her sister Nicole, who was married to Brian? After O'Keefe got to Albert's home, he began texting McCabe to make sure she was there, since she was the only person he knew well, or at all. When he entered, he was surprised to see 18-year-old Colin Albert was there, who likely confronted him at some point and hit him, according to the theory proposed by Alan Jackson and David Yanetti in their court filings. Our sources believe that Bryant Albert joined in on the beating, alarming his loyal German Shepherd, which immediately began to tear into John O'Keefe's arm. Despite being their family dog, Brian Albert got rid of Chloe and never explained where the dog went. The defense team has since filed motions to try to get animal control records about the dog, which for some reason the ADA's office objected to. Unfortunately for him, the defense won their motion and the records were impounded. And as I speak right now, they are still trying to get those unimpounded. A motion has been filed on June 7th for that. Definitely in that house that night were Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, Brian Albert Jr., Colin Albert, Caitlin Albert, Jennifer and Matthew McCabe, friends of Albert Jr. named Julie Nagel, Emily Fabiano, and Sarah Levinson, and an ATF agent named Brian Higgins, who has an office inside the Canton Police Department. O'Keefe would make 12 at a minimum. We have one picture of Higgins with O'Keefe who was with Brian Albert earlier in the day in New York, and they had driven back after a police officer's funeral there, and they've been very chummy since then. This means that all of these people either witnessed the murder or somehow had no idea that a murder took place in a house they were in, and they've said nothing. Not one of them claims to have seen a six foot two, 217 pound body lying on the front lawn after leaving. One witness named Ryan Nagel went to the home to pick up 
his sister, Julie, who ended up staying there. He was the only witness who had no familial ties to the Alvarez, and thus no reason to frame Karen Reed. He said that he witnessed Reed outside of the house. They arrived uh, on Fairview Road at basically the same time, coming from different directions. He yielded to her. He allowed her to turn right onto the street. Now, keep in mind, it was snowing, and visibility was difficult. So Karen Reed pulled up in front of the driveway, and she claims that John O'Keefe got out and ran into the house. She then pulled up a little further along the left-hand side of the property and said that she was beginning to text him because he was supposed to text her back to let her know everything's all set, you can go home now. Ryan Nagel has all but confirmed that this is exactly what happened because, because according to his own testimony, he said that he didn't see any damage to her vehicle, never heard any screams, never witnessed her operating the vehicle erratically, and when he drove by her, she most importantly, she was alone in the vehicle and her interior lights were on. Her hands were at 10 and 2, yet John O'Keefe's body was not on the ground, so where he could he be if not inside the house? Additionally, O'Keefe's phone tracked him walking up and down the stairs, ascending and descending inside the Albert home from 1220 to 21, rather, to 1224. Obviously, it would not show this sort of up and down motion if he was inside Karen Reed's car or lying on the ground outside the home. And remember, the cell phone says he's in there between 1221 and 1224. Jennifer McCabe said he did not arrive there until 1230. State police and the DA's office deliberately kept all of this information from the defense, including Jennifer McCabe's incriminating Google search. Jennifer McCabe's cell phone analysis shows that she left the Albert house at 1.47 a.m. with Matthew McCabe, Julie Nagel, and Sarah Levinson. Alan Jackson asserted in his filings that she gave the other two a ride home because they lived near Meadows Ave and she wanted to drive by John O'Keefe's house to see if Karen and Reed was up to understand whether or not they had time to get rid of his body or whether or not she was up wondering where he was. So she dropped them both off at 227. Her Apple watch recorded her going to her bedroom and Googling how long to die in cold, despite previously telling police that she assumed that John O'Keefe had gone home with Karen Reed. Why would she Google that if she thought he was home sleeping? A normal person after a night of drinking would be sleeping at 2.30 a.m. McCabe, instead of going to bed, elected to pace around her house nervously. That's what the Apple Health data shows. Waiting for Karen Reed to contact her and ask where O'Keefe was. Somehow she anticipated this happening despite allegedly having no idea that John O'Keefe was missing. McCabe waited up for Reed because number one, she needed to be with her when Reed discovered the body so that she could control the narrative with the police. And number two, she needed to put the idea in Reed's head that she might have accidentally hit and killed John O'Keefe while driving drunk and had no recollection of it. Reed truly believed that she might have done this and was distraught. His body was staged at the exact place where she was seen dropping him off before leaving. Although it is interesting that they claim that she did a three-point turn, but only Michael Proctor claims that. He claims that Reed told him that she did a three-point turn. Except that makes no sense. That, of course, would be the only way that she could have backed into John O'Keefe is if she did a three-point turn. If she just kept going straight south on Fairview Road, then she couldn't have backed into him. Both Jennifer and Matt McCabe claimed that that is the exact direction that she went in, was south, that there was no three-point turn. Despite barely knowing Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe gleefully jumped in the car with her and Kerry Roberts. It is believed, or asserted by the defense, that this intentional delay guaranteed that O'Keefe would be dead by the time anyone found him. Remember, how long to die in cold? And that he would be unable to tell the real story about what happened. It is important to point out that when John O'Keefe was put outside to die, he was still alive. They did this so that the medical examiner could say that one of the causes of his death was hypothermia. Remember also that Jennifer McCabe initially told investigators that Karen Reed brought in a drink from another bar to the waterfall bar, which only a drunken, low-class individual would do. But Karen Reed had a good job and made good money. Why would she do such a thing? Nevertheless, McCabe successfully planted the seed in Reed's brain that she may have accidentally killed O'Keefe. Jennifer McCabe also deleted phone calls to her sister Nicole Albert at 607 and 608. Those are now gone. They were seven and nine seconds long and someone answered that phone. Now, ADA Lally has since claimed that that's evidence 
that the calls went to voicemail, except only unanswered calls go to voicemail, and that makes no sense. This proved that McCabe had made them aware that there was a dead body outside of their house. There was not enough time for her to explain, oh my God, there's a dead body out here. I don't know what's going on, but there were, there was plenty of time in seven to nine seconds to say, Darren Reed is here. Don't come outside. This proved that McCabe made them aware that there was a dead body outside the house. Yet Brian Albert, a veteran Boston police officer and trained first responder, did not even come outside despite the fact that there were a plethora of emergency vehicles, a lot of people making noises, blue and red lights flashing everywhere and radios going off and oh yeah, a screaming hysterical woman on his front lawn named Karen Reed. A broken cocktail glass was found next to O'Keefe's body, which Canton police initially said was the murder weapon. O'Keefe's body was clearly visible as not much snow had accumulated, yet McCabe and Roberts didn't see it. Only Karen Reed did. After notifying the Alberts about the dead cop on their property, Jennifer McCabe googled, quote, how long does it take to digest food? Ten minutes after finding a body. The presence of food particles in a dead person's stomach helped pathologists determine time of death. At this point, Jen McCabe was panicking because she knew how suspicious the how long to die in cold Google search was at 2.27 a.m. She decided to search for that same thing again after discovering O'Keefe's body, hoping that it would make it look less suspicious. And as this might be something a person might Google after finding a body outside. In doing so, she hoped that it would make the first search disappear. Unfortunately, she spelt the words wrong the first time she searched it. Not even close to the original Hoss Long to Die in Cold. The second time, she spelt it the exact exact same way. Hoss long to die in cold. Not how. This was intentional. She later told law enforcement that it was Karen Reed who told her to Google that. Luckily for McCabe, Brian Albert's brother was a Canton cop. His other brother was a selectman. His neighbor is the deputy chief and the trooper in charge of the investigation was a close family friend who helped cover up the murder. It was going to be covered up regardless. When you thought that Jennifer McCabe couldn't get any lower, she also has been sharing fundraisers for John O'Keefe despite helping to cover up for his murder. Jennifer McCabe goes to every single court date. She comforts the family of John O'Keefe. She has John O'Keefe's badge number decaled on the back of her car. She has blue lights in front of her house and constantly wears thin blue line stuff everywhere. She is utterly shameless. Obviously, Jennifer McCabe did not tell John O'Keefe since she's not physically capable of that, but Brian Albert, Colin Albert, and the dog were more than capable of that. And Colin Albert had the motive. McCabe was just the quarterback of the cover-up. And seemed to want to protect Brian Albert more than even his own wife did. Take from that what you will. Jennifer McCabe would never have been able to cover up this murder without the assistance of law enforcement, despite the fact that it was one of her own, their own rather, who was killed. According to Reed's defense attorneys, the original Canton Police Department report had been altered. In the altered report, it never stated the cert team found the taillight at 6 p.m. after Trooper Proctor had taken possession of Reed's vehicle. The altered report also had a different cell phone number that McCabe called after finding the body indicating that police were taking steps to make sure that Brian Albert was not in any way a suspect. New evidence has also shown that Albert rehomed the dog that attacked O'Keefe. He claims to know where that dog is, yet they won't go tell the court where it is. In September of 2022, Reed's lawyers publicly accused the Albert family in open court of being implicated in John O'Keefe's murder, and they ordered them through the judge not to delete anything from their phones. Two weeks later, Tim Albert, the Fredo of the family, posted a meme on Facebook stating, Stating, quote, you don't fuck with my family and that he won't hesitate to make you miserable if you do. Just a couple days after these filings were made in court, Tim Albert decided that it would be a good time in October to fill in his pool. Nothing shady about that. Tim is the loser of the family who seeks approval by virtue signaling about how loyal he is so that he can enjoy the fruits of the success while contributing nothing himself. This post was clearly a direct attempt to intimidate Karen Reed, her attorneys, and reporters like me who expose people like him for being dirtbags. After after being accused in September by Reed's attorneys, Brian Albert immediately decided that it would be a good time to sell his childhood home, which had been in the family for almost 50 years. It sold rather quickly for $50,000 less than they were asking for it. And as a result, was never searched by police, despite the fact that a Boston cop was probably murdered inside of it and was found dead on that property. The person most responsible for the cover-up is certainly Trooper Proctor, who failed to speak to key witnesses, protected his close friends, and never applied for geofence data that would show the 
the identities of every person in that house that night. We later found out that he lied about what time that he arrived at Karen Reed's parents' house in order to have the car by himself for one hour and 18 minutes. We also found out that in his reports, he intentionally misspelled the names of at least four witnesses, including Sarah Levinson, Caitlin Albert, a woman by the name of Emily Fabiano, and Catherine Duty, whose father... Charles Duty happens to be the town moderator and was the chief of the Canton Police Department at the time that John O'Keefe died. However, Brian Albert didn't mention until April of 2022 in front of a grand jury that his dog was aggressive and not great with strangers. Despite being uh, at an after party, everyone at 34 Fairview Road fled the home within an hour after O'Keefe had arrived. Cool party. Remember, they allegedly had no idea he was dead, so why would they all leave the scene of the crime? If they're there to party, can police use red solo cups to store blood evidence at the scene of the crime, but did not discover any pieces of a broken taillight in there for a search. Remember, only two inches of snow had fallen by 6 a.m. when the Canton Police Department arrived. Two hours later, the state police took over the investigation and and 12 hours later is when over a foot of snow had fallen and boom, Trooper Proctor magically found not only pieces of taillight fragment everywhere, but John's other missing shoe, which was not there at the time of the first search by the Canton Police Department. So then how did Karen Reed break her taillight? Well, ring surveillance video from Reed's home shows her backing into O'Keefe's car and slightly hitting it on the way to search for him. On the way out, you can see that the taillight is slightly cracked, although certainly not shattered. It is believed that during that hour and 18 minutes trooper proctor had the car unaccounted for he may have smashed it up a little bit more so how did they find all these pieces of taillight after the can police did not find any well that would be trooper proctor who as i stated was able to have the car unaccounted for for one hour and 18 minutes luckily uh they found it the second time they just decided to search the scene of the crime on a hunch and even more remarkably canton police chief ken berkowitz also decided to go to the scene of the crime on a hunch on february 4th and noticed more pieces of the taillight from his moving vehicle. Berkowitz had been called by ATF agent Brian Higgins, who was in the house when O'Keefe was murdered immediately after the killing. Brian Higgins turned out to be a good friend of Ken Berkowitz and helped organize his retirement party several months later, which Brian Albert also attended along with District Attorney Michael Morrissey. Trooper Proctor also went out of his way to make sure that Google didn't send him all the geofence data that the defense had requested. Karen Reed appears to be a completely innocent woman. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at 6 in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Wrongly charged by corrupt cops who would see her rot in prison in order to cover up a murder of a fellow police officer. If she didn't have the resources, then none of this would have come out. Trooper Proctor and the district attorney's office went out of their way to make sure that evidence that they knew would exonerate her would never be given to the defense team. As a result of O'Keefe's, O'Keefe's niece and nephew, whom she loved as her own, now believe that she killed their adopted father. Trooper Proctor, Brian Albert, Colin Albert, Jennifer McCabe, and Brian Higgins all deserve to spend time in jail. And two of them, at least should be charged with murder. The Canton police chief and deputy chief should both be fired. But as I said, Ken Berkowitz decided it would be a good time to resign after this. We hope that Karen Reed sues all these people after she's exonerated and that the bad guys go to jail. Every single person in that house should be charged with obstruction of justice as they witnessed a crime and never reported it. They all lie. There is no possible way that they could not have seen a body on the way out. There is no possible way. So either the body was not there, in which case Karen Reed did not strike him or they are all lying to the police. You pick which one they're doing. Haven't even begun to see the really crazy shit.